honor to invite our moderate of this panel, Kobe Haberman. Kobe is the, the co-founder of the Israeli Peace Initiative Israel, it's Israel Yozemet, and the CEO of Strategic Landscape, Kobe. Uh, can you hear me well? Maybe. Maybe I'll speak to the box. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, before we start the panel, we thought we would give you a short overview of the basic concept and ideas that the IPI group is promoting and the idea is based on the fact that we see the regional chaos as an opportunity. We are a political group, we believe in, in the fact that there is an opportunity that requires a new vision for the state of Israel. We believe that the current status quo may be a danger to Israel as a Jewish state. We believe that we need to think again about bilateral negotiation model and to be uh, something to be replaced by a regional deal. And we would like to show you that there are some new voices from the Arab world. Our vision of Israel is of Israel becoming a real regional superpower, secure with clear Jewish majority, with social economic growth, with continuation of its role as an innovation hub for the world and for the region, <coughs> a role model democracy, an integral part of a potential new regional alliance. Every day in the past few years, when we look at the map of risks that surrounds Israel and its view of the Arab state, we see no, not just terrorist activities, and military threat, but also economic threats that are posing a huge risk to the stability of the region. In fact, if we look at an illustrated new map of interest in the Middle East, we can see Israel and a few of the Arab states as actually belonging to the same bloc. And in fact, we see that it is a group of states facing two very dangerous blocks, the Shiite and the Sunni, terrorist activities. And we see also a few states that are not decided yet. It's a new formation of the Middle East and one that offers new opportunities. Indeed, if we look at the threats to this new emerging blue-white block, with Israel and a few of the key Arab states, we see the need for three key strategies to be developed to create a diplomatic alliance to close the file on the Israeli-Arab conflict. We see a need to create a security alliance to confront the security threats. And we need to see a joint effort on regional economic development to address the ticking bomb of 100 million potentially unemployed young Arabs in the next decades. Because of that, um, the key uh, to the uh, feasibility of these alliances is clearly solving the problems with the Palestinians. However, when we look at past history, this has failed again and again and again. And we want to offer a slightly different explanation why it is the case. We think that the model of a bilateral agreement between us and the Palestinians requires Israel to make huge concessions in return to very little that the Palestinians can offer, and we want to change the model and actually balance those concessions with real normalization efforts, economic development and security cooperation offered by the Arab world. In fact, we think that the key benefit is, are, are two. We will be able to look at a regional security mechanism, a very different one uh, compared to what we have today. 
And we will also be able to see huge impact on the Israeli economy. These are the results of two major studies that the IPI group has conducted on the future regional security mechanism and the future impact on the Israeli economy. But more importantly, we would like also to show you that there are emerging new voices in both Israel and in the region. Let's watch this short movie. <laughs> Is the Saudi proposal, the peace proposal, still relevant? Before this time, the Arab believe, or they want to push Israel out of the Palestine. But Israel become reality in the, in the, in the land. For the reason, Saudi Arabia like to live together, Israel and the Arab countries. הגנרל הסעודי אנואר אשקי הוא לא היחיד. מנהיגים ערבים רבים באזור מצטרפים לקו הזה בראשות הסיסי, נשיא מצרים, המדינה הערבית הגדולה ביותר. أنا بقول لكم هتكتب صفحة أخرى جديدة لا تقل يمكن تزيد عن جشين بين إشيم سعوديم لبين إشيم إسرائيليم أينام دبار خريج بتكوفة آخرونا cooperation between Arab countries and Israel in meeting the threats wherever they come from whether it is Iran or any other source of that, um, would be much better fortified in a, in a situation where there is peace. להצהרות הללו הייתה תהודה במקומות אחרים. המצב הגיאופוליטי החדש במזרח התיכון מוליד אינטרסים ואויבים משותפים. שר החוץ הבחרייני אומר חד משמעית שאיראן מסכנת את מדינות המפרץ והמזרח התיכון יותר מישראל. גם בכווית עיתון ממשלתי מצהיר לראשונה שישראל היא לא האויבת של כווית. גם הנשיא מחמוד עבאס between us and Israel. We want to achieve peace in the region. I think many Israelis would be surprised to see, uh, especially in Turkey after the, the, the last four or five years, how many people uh, would be willing to engage uh, with Israel. We will be cohabiting the same region and uh, one of the things we are missing right now is a regional security framework. So we need to think, uh, it's very easy to think of your own country as some fortress that needs to be defended against all threats. But on, on the other hand, we live in a world where we interact with each other, it's a global world, uh, and a, a regional framework is something that we need to discuss and talk about. טוני בלר, המעורב במגעים עם מנהיגי האזור, העביר מסר חסר תקדים לישראל. Think of what we can do on, on, on science, on technology, on humanitarian affairs. אני מוכן בכל ליבי להגן על השלום. אני חושבת שאין אזרח במדינת ישראל שהיה מוכן לשלם את המחיר, רק שיגיע שלום. מדברים על מגעים עם מצרים, 
ועל uh, מדינות ערב uh, פה באזור. Uh, כולי תקווה שזה יוביל למשהו. We'll start with your uh, reception of what has been discussed here. So please, Ambassador Ross. Uh, well, look, first I think that's a, uh, it's an interesting, provocative way to start our discussion. Uh, I do think there's a lot of elements there that, that capture a new reality. So let me talk a couple of minutes about what I think the new reality is. Uh, why I also agree that there has to be a different approach to peacemaking that can't be strictly a bilateral one, but also this is not going to be a, a simple process. And so, so the first, I think, important point is there is a new landscape in the Middle East. I have a colleague at the Washington Institute who likes to refer to Israel as the first Jewish Sunni state. <laughs> so he's not totally right or wrong. There is an interesting convergence of interest and threat, threat perception. It's not the first time. You know, I have a, I have a book out called Doomed to Succeed, the U.S.-Israeli Relationship from Truman to Obama. So I've gone through every American administration from Truman up to today. And if you look at what Alexander Haig was saying in 1981, at that time he said there is a new strategic alignment. Uh, he said in the aftermath, I understand that it had been the Islamic Revolution in 1979 in Iran. He said the Arab states fear the Iranians, the Israelis fear the Iranians, uh, the Arab states fear the Soviets, the Israelis fear the Soviets. We have a basis for a new strategic alignment. Sounded good, right? Right? Yeah. Did it happen? No. But there's a difference today. There is a difference today. Today, the, if you look at what exists, you see the Arab Gulf states look at Israel as a bulwark, maybe the most important bulwark against the Iranians. Egypt and Jordan look at Israel uh, as a bulwark, as a partner, security partner, uh, against radical Sunni Islamist threats, ISIS and ISIS-related groups. So there is today not just a strategic convergence of interests, a common threat perception, but there is a sense that they can actually work together, and there is obviously a level of cooperation now that is below the radar screen, but that doesn't make that cooperation any less real. Now, it is below the radar screen because of the Palestinian issue, and you can't wish that away. And here I want to get into this notion of what is probably required, and why the idea of uh, a kind of strict bilateral approach to negotiations, which obviously I was the, you know, I was, no one believed in that model more strongly than I have. But I look at the Palestinians today, and the Palestinians are too weak, they're too divided, they're too consumed by thinking about succession. They're too consumed by their own sense of deep uh, grievance and a sense of injustice to be able to negotiate. They look at negotiations today as a concession, uh, and the ability to make a concession in a negotiation probably doesn't exist. So they need an air of cover, for sure. But Israel also needs a kind of air of cover because you, I think you actually showed it very well in your film. Most Israelis believe that if you make concessions towards the Palestinians, you don't get anything in return. So here, the question is, if you're going to make concessions towards the Palestinians, you get something in return from the Arabs. There is a logic for that. So the Palestinians need a cover of the Arabs because on their own, 
either they can't negotiate or they certainly can't negotiate and make concessions and they need a cover from the Arabs. Now the Arabs can't take the place of the Palestinians and they won't take the place of the Palestinians. And no one should believe that you'll be able to solve the Palestinian problem on the cheap. Understand one thing, that if Arab states are gonna play this role along with the Palestinians, they're gonna to wanna to be playing it in a way where they will justify their position by being able to show they delivered for the Palestinians what the Palestinians could not deliver for themselves. So this is not a way to sort of deal with the Palestinian issue on the cheap. It is a way, potentially, to deal with the Palestinian issue where Israel gets something in return. Now the critical question is, do the key Arab states have the requisite interest to do this? Do they have the bandwidth? The Gulf states are mostly consumed by their preoccupation with the threat from the Iranians. Egypt and Jordan are dealing with another set of threats. Egypt, you certainly see it from President Sisi, and I was in a meeting with him last Monday in New York. He clearly does have an interest in this. The question is whether others will have an interest in it. Pushing, you know, we will have a new administration in January. I know you heard from the proponents of one of them last night. <laughs> um, all I can say is, um, when I look analytically at the two candidates, I see one who doesn't know much about the region, I see another one who does know something about the region, uh, and I think if you're going to deal with this region, it starts with actually understanding its dynamics. You're not going to go very far if you don't. <laughs> And one key here is that because the current administration uh, has really lost the kind of confidence of Arabs and Israelis, I mean, I'm talking about its leaders, the ability to test something like this will come from a new administration. But that new administration can't launch a big public initiative. If it launches a big public initiative, you force each side to adopt their most maximal position. This is the kind of issue, the very thing that you're raising, the very ideas you're raising, I think, obviously, as I'm suggesting, is not only something that has potential, it may be the best pathway toward doing something over time, but it has to be probed in private first, and it has to be put in the context of a new administration reestablishing confidence. If you're going to reestablish the confidence of the Gulf Arab states, they need to see that you take the Iranian threat as seriously as they do. Uh, and you establish some level of confidence there. I think the new administration has to build a new relationship with the Egyptians as well. I think with Jordan, it's a little simpler. But I think if you probe this in private, you have the potential, I think, to see whether there is both the bandwidth and the interest to do something. It is definitely worth probing. Uh, one shouldn't think that it's going to be easy, however. Thank you, Dennis. Dana, your perspective. Thank you, um, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the organizers that I see. It's great to be back, and I look at the crowd, and I see that um, there are things to talk about, and there are people to listen, there are want to listen, so this is going to be an interesting conference. Um, uh, when I think of this issue, I want to put two, um, two sayings on the table. The first saying is something that Henry Kissinger uh, observed uh, way back about the Israeli um, atmosphere, political atmosphere about our country, and he said that Israel has no foreign policy, it only has politics. That's one saying I want to put on the table, and the second one is timing is everything. And I think we are actually looking at your initiative and coming from an Israeli perspective, following politics in Israel, I think we're also talking about a tragedy. Because if I would have told you 20 or 30 years ago that we would be listening to Arab leaders talking peace, sounding like Shalom Achshav, you know, like the left, let's extending their hand for peace, we wouldn't have believed it, right? It would have been surreal, couldn't be, couldn't happen. And so there's a real opportunity, there's a real change in the region, each country for our own reasons, and I, you know, I totally agree with, with um, Ambassador Ross, but when you zoom into the Israeli public, these new um, sounds of peace coming from the region are meeting a political and system in a country which is closing its ears to those sounds. Now we have to understand there will no there will be no an 
to try a um, regional um, initiative without uh, solving one way or another the Palestinian issue. It is the glass ceiling above all of this. Now, if we think of it from a Jewish or an Israeli perspective, we wouldn't agree that the United States would go ahead and make an agreement with Iran, for example, without taking into consideration our, our, our feelings, right? The Jews of the United States would feel bad if someone would impose a deal without thinking about our brothers and sisters in Israel. It's the same thing with the Palestinians and the Arabs. So I think when we look at the political system today in Israel, it is moving away from any solution with the Palestinians. The public has lost hope and is moving away. And um, even, the, um, even the attempt to form a unity government is being blocked by um, the sentiment on the street, the sentiment in the political atmosphere. So actually, there is a regional opportunity, but it involves something that the Israeli politics will not go ahead. Prime Minister Netanyahu, has said time and again, even in the interview he gave last night on Channel 2, that he is for, um, he doesn't want one state and he wants a solution. Can he actually even impose moving 40 um, <coughs> caravans which are on private Palestinian land that has to, they have to be moved by the end of December? Will he manage to do that without losing his government? I don't know, we're talking about 40 caravans on private property. There's no brainer there. Is he going to do that? So when we talk about regional change, we're going to have to address the Palestinian issue and we're going to have to try and see how our political system can go ahead and do that. I'm not very optimistic. Thank you. Professor Dr. Yeah, uh, well first of all, it's good to be here. And secondly, uh, Dana started with uh, Andy Kissinger, so for what I want to say, I'd also like to start with Henry Kissinger. <laughs> you know, with uh, 1973, uh, after the Yom Kippur War, when everything was, you know, uh, Kissinger came over and basically pressed Israel to make uh, serious concessions. There was you know, a lot of uh, talk in Israel, how come Henry Kissinger, after a war like that, presses Israel so strongly, huge criticism, and Henry got really, really angry because they called a name, so he came to Golda Meir. And our Prime Minister, the only man in the government, <laughs> said, Golda, Golda, I want to make something perfectly clear here. First and foremost, I'm the Secretary of State of the United States of America. Secondly, I'm an American citizen, and only thirdly, I'm of Jewish origin. Golda Meir looked him in the eye and said, I know Henry, but you will read from right to left. Let me read. Let me read from my today. Why read from my today? To give you really a feeling, okay? Because it's obvious that uh, that the opportunities are there. But I want to first tell you about the opportunities, and then the challenges that, uh, especially after a movie, uh, you know, a clip like that, it automatically raises my internal instincts to try and give you the other side. Uh, but let's talk about the opportunities, okay? The United Nations is a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful vantage point to see what's going on in the Arab world. So what do you see in the United Nations? You see things that we haven't seen for years. A Saudi ambassador physically shaking, okay? Going on the podium and pointing towards the Iranian ambassador and saying to him, you tried to assassinate my ambassador, Adel Jubeir, by the way, today the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia in Washington, D.C., in a restaurant called Cafe Milano, which I love, and Dennis knows, it's just two wrongs and one move. <laughs> the Iranian ambassador comes back and basically trashes the Saudi ambassador. The Saudi ambassador goes after Bashar al-Jafri, the Syrian ambassador. Bashar al-Jafri is the only person I know that can lie for 40 consecutive minutes. I think when he snores, he lies. Okay. But this time around, the Kuwaiti ambassador stands up. I didn't even know he had vocal cords. And moves, <laughs> moves the side to wait from horizontal to vertical, saying in UN terms, I want to say something. And what does he say? Not only do I vote against Syria, but I co-sponsor a resolution against Syria. And I sit there and say, continue, gentlemen. <laughs> but what does it show? It shows everything that you see here. The changing coalitions, things that basically 
when you look at them, <laughs> tell us one story. That when we always talk about the threats, especially when stormy waters are out there, you have to navigate through high waves, the opportunities are there. Suddenly we have coinciding interests with the Arab world, with the Gulfis. Why? Not because they give a toss about the Palestinians, but they feel that the rope is tightening around their necks because of the Iranian issue. Mm -hmm. For me as the state of Israel, I don't care why. For the first time, I have those coinciding interests. So I have to utilize and use them. Problem. It's not easy. Dennis alluded to that. There's no one in the room with more experience, really, and patience uh, with the amazing Semitic uh, people around in the region to try and read something. What are the challenges? Now, seriously, this is not just a pushover. The challenges are that you saw in this uh, little graph uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and Jordan, right? What are they? Those that, they are the custodians of the holy places, okay? <clears throat> they are the, basically the monarchies that, why am I telling you the story? Because Jerusalem is very important for them, okay? So they have to decide politically that they are willing to go on a political limb on conflict. We want to reach a comprehensive agreement, right? Now, are they capable to do that? What happens above the radio screen? What happens under the radio screen? I can tell you, and you can be happy we're not doing it enough, but there is a lot that is done under the radar screen. What I learned, not from the Gulf, but from Washington, D.C., that the people who go on record to talk usually have little influence from the inside. <laughs> I saw, and I don't want to use names, a former national security advisor who Condoleezza Rice worked for, when he started talking in the, in the newspapers and going on interviews, I knew his influence was very, very small on the White House. Now, some of the people that you see here, some have clout, some I know do not have clout, okay? So there's a difference in that. We have to really create a situation where things are being talked about. But the challenge, like I said, is are they willing? Is Mohammed bin Salman, with the internal problems with Mohammed bin Naif, with the problems with Yemen and what happens in Syria, really able to, is willing to go on a political capital that has to be put on the table? I, I think they're willing to do that under maybe an Egyptian umbrella. How do you create structures like that? Okay? Not easy, not a pushover. So, in the sense, I feel that today we against our real instincts of looking at seeing, you know, just the volcanoes erupting around us, here I absolutely think we have something which is unique, something that we can utilize, and something that we need in order to reach comprehensive peace only with the Arab world and the support of the Arab world are we able to help the Palestinians do the heavy lifting that they cannot do by themselves on the final status issues? So the bottom line, yes, but. <laughs> and Shimon Peres, by the way, we all, this is really important. You know, first of all, you know that I love him. I think everyone, you know, former president, and, uh, and if he would be here, he'd probably say, you know, Dana, we need more solutions than resolutions. <laughs> Good afternoon. Nice to be here. I am the only scholar on the panel. So I'll uh, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I can speak only based on theories of alliance formation and conflict resolution and open source. I've not been involved in any serious negotiations. Based on our theoretical knowledge, there is an opportunity that I share um, 
my observations, my observations with <coughs> Ambassador Rambasor, that it's going to be very difficult to implement it or to <coughs> exploit it. I think that Israel should do whatever it can <coughs> to promote the idea, but it does not depend, <coughs> as Dana suggested, only on the Israeli position. There are two sides, and in my judgment, the probability of the other side to look for a regional solution uh, is not so good. The Palestinians know that this is in the making, and therefore they raise the price. And raising the price makes it much more difficult to achieve a, a solution. Uh, I've, there have been many attempts to forcefully link resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to regional issues. We have been told many times, and in Europe this is still the view, that this is a key conflict in the <coughs> Middle East, and resolution of the conflict uh, will bring uh, peace and stability to the entire region. This has never been true, and it is even not true today. We have been told uh, by the Obama administration in the first term that resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a key to creating a block against Iran. This was also false because it assumes that Saudi Arabia, the Persian Gulf countries, uh, Egypt and Jordan uh, 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 think about the Palestinian issue as more important uh, than their own national interest. And this is obviously uh, not the case. Uh, the, obviously, uh, the opportunity emerges from a number of issues that some of them have been mentioned. One of them is, has not been mentioned, that is U.S. decline. The feeling in the region is the United States uh, is disengaging from the region. It achieved uh, energy independence. Uh, and the Middle East is too, too complicated, too many failures in recent years, and so going out, everything is withdrawal, going out, uh, lack of leadership, leadership from behind, all kinds of terms. And so if the United States is not there, and on the other hand, Putin is asserting his power, then you have to think about other allies who share interests with you. But as Bismarck said, there are not permanent uh, friends or permanent enemies, there are always permanent interests. And interests keep uh, changing uh, all the time. I see a major problem with the Palestinian attitude, which, have to be, which will have to be changed in order to achieve an agreement. This can be seen in all kinds of recent publications about the US role. A colleague of mine from Harvard University, Michael Mendelbaum, wrote an excellent book just published by Oxford University Press called Mission Failure and he talks about American foreign policy in general and the attitude toward the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in particular. And Shlomo Abineri, who belongs to the left in Israel, has written also about the Palestinian issue. And uh, this is the problem. The problem is that they are unwilling or are unable to reach a comprehensive peace agreement with Israel. We tend to believe that this is a conflict between two national movements. That the problem is only territory. And once the territorial issue is resolved, then we will have a comprehensive peace with the Palestinians. The problem is that the Palestinians think only about themselves as a national movement. They don't think the Jews have a national movement. And therefore, they do not recognize the right of the Jews to have their own state. How do we know that? From a number of, uh, number of uh, uh, attitudes. One is that the Palestinians in the educational system have no map of Israel. They, they insist on the right of return, contrary to what we are hearing all the time. Mahmoud Abbas just said it a few days ago. They do not want to recognize Israel as a Jewish state for this reason, because they do not think the Jews have the right for self-determination. And, uh, and, they, and two states to two peoples. You know, you wrote two states, right? Palestinians don't use the phrase two states to two peoples. Only two states. Only two states. So my assumption is that 
They are not ready for a comprehensive resolution of, of the conflict. I think that the Arab initiative, which has been mentioned, uh, is irrelevant to what we have today because it says a comprehensive peace, Syria, Lebanon included, how you can do peace with Syria, how you can return the Golan Heights, peace with Lebanon, with whom, on what. So it's irrelevant. So I think that under, and I, I agree, that progress, not resolution, even progress on the Palestinian issue can improve the chances for greater and more open to the public of cooperation with uh, Sunni moderate Arab states. But I think that it's going to be very difficult and I think the assumption that first you resolve the Palestinian issue and then increase cooperation with the Arab Sunni governments is wrong. I think it should be reversed. I think we, Israel should build enough relations under the table with the moderate Arab uh, Sunni countries and then go to the Palestinian and go to, go to another attempt to resolve the Palestinian issue. Thanks. I'd like, I'd like to address one of the points made by uh, Professor Gilboa, and that is the potential new role of the U.S. in the next administration. Two questions. First of all, can the administration depart from the current paradigm of bilateral negotiation led by a U.S. mediator and build a more regional, a more nuanced approach? And second, since we believe that any regional package deal must, be, uh, must rely on a regional leadership led by Egypt, backed by Saudi Arabia, uh, coordinated by Jordan, and maybe funded and supported by the UAE, what does the current relationship between the US and Egypt and US and Saudi Arabia mean to the feasibility of the U.S. leading a more regional package? Um, simple questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, look, I think the, um, in a lot of ways, the Obama administration, not by design, uh, but by its posture, ironically helped to drive the key Arab states and the Israelis together. Um, wasn't what they necessarily were trying to produce, but it is what emerged from the perception, in fact, that the U.S. was, as Professor Gilboa described it using a series of phrases, uh, was withdrawing from the region or was more hesitant in the region, and precisely because of that, it required, uh, it essentially required those states in the region who saw common threats to begin to cooperate more under the table. Right? So the reason everything is under the table is because, again, the Palestinian issue, not because, it's not because necessarily the Arab states are preoccupied with the Palestinian issue, but the Palestinian issue resonates on their street. It still is an issue that is seen as a source of injustice, and so they're not going to expose themselves on this issue publicly by what they do with the Israelis, but they'll do things with the Israelis in private because their needs require it and they have something to gain from it. Right, so that's the context in terms of responding to the questions. Can the U.S. adopt a posture, and this is implicit in your question, that restores a level of confidence among these key Arab states, which by the way is also necessary for another reason. I don't know whether they're prepared to expose themselves on the Palestinian issue. I don't know. I think that's why I say you have to test this. You can't assume it, you have to test it. But their readiness to expose themselves on an issue will go up the greater degree that they have confidence in the United States. Do I think the next administration can, A, will restore a position that makes it clear that we are not hesitant in the region, we are not gonna withdraw from the region. We understand that when we do withdraw, it creates vacuums and the vacuums get filled by the worst forces. 
I think the next administration, depending upon who gets elected, uh, you know, I... There was an implicit assumption in my well, question. Well, yeah, there is an implicit assumption in your question. Um, I said earlier, you know, look at the two candidates. I prefer to speak analytically and not politically. I'm highly settled when I do so. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're talking about these two candidates, there's one who at this point you really don't know what he would do. I mean, anybody who says they know what he would do is probably kidding themselves. He does not know what he wants to do. Well, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> so the other candidate, I think, uh, basically believes that it is a mistake for the U.S. not to be engaged in the region. It is a mistake for the U.S. to allow vacuums to occur in the region. That becomes a threat not just to our friends, but to the United States as well. I like to say that the Las Vegas rules don't apply to the Middle East. What takes place in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. Uh, and so I think the, the key to answering your question, A, depends upon what the outcome of our election is. B, it depends upon the U.S. acting in a way that, that restores the level of confidence. I mean, today, the U.S. relationship with Egypt is not where it needs to be uh, for a lot of reasons, but certainly for Egypt to play the role, even though clearly President Sisi is out there publicly wanting to play this role, he's, he needs a certain kind of relationship with the United States. Others in the region also need a certain kind of relationship with the United States. I said earlier, you know, the Gulf states in particular, meaning the, the Saudis and the Emiratis in particular, they need to see that the U.S. gets the nature of the Iranian threat in a way that today they believe it does not. Now, one way to, 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 quick, to quickly prove that we do is to establish contingency planning with them to start to deal with what the Iranians are doing. The Iranians are using Shia militias as a, basically as an instrument to weaken every Sunni government wherever those Shia militias happen to be. The more we would develop a set of options to counter that with them, the, the immediate signal it would send is that we get the nature of the threat. So we have to, that kind of is a, is a, a first move that is required. Uh, and then we can begin to probe to see what's possible. I, I do, it's, it's interesting, if, uh, Dana focused more on the Israeli side of what needs to be done in the context and what potentially can be done in the context of this new reality. Uh, Ron focused on his experience uh, at the UN and what it tells him about the, the new landscape, but also he raised questions about the priorities of different Arab leaders. Uh, and there's no question, having just returned from Saudi Arabia, having seen the king, the crown prince, the deputy crown prince, and six ministers, I can tell you, the priority on the inside is modernization. <laughs> they are out to transform the country. Uh, and you know, that priority is a domestic priority. Their external priority is Iran, countering Iran. So where does this fit in those priorities? Unless this issue is seen as being relevant to those other priorities, it isn't that they would be against this. The question is, will they, will they play this kind of a, a more prominent role? And a lot depends upon whether or not they think this issue is important enough to be able to do that. And again, you can argue that, well, we know they don't. But I, I prefer, rather than assuming, I prefer to test. So the long-winded answer to your very direct questions, I think it comes down to who gets elected here. I am confident that uh, in the case of one candidate being elected, that you will see the US begin to move to restore its position with its traditional friends in the region, uh, and that will create more of a basis to test what may be possible uh, in terms of creating this kind of new approach to, to the region. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take the conversation from here and challenge our three panelists. Uh, first, 
I'd like to start with, with you, uh, Dana. Here are a few facts. Did you notice that the, mil the, the Mr. Gibo Professor Gibbo said he's the only scholar, so you did notice I'm the only woman, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> well um, I'm going to challenge men as well. No, I'm just <laughs> so, you know, I'm stuck uh, with being the blonde, but I'm the blonde. You're the professor. It's okay. uh, well, uh, I don't know what that makes us. But <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let's put it this way. By now, I know I'm not a scholar, and I'm certainly not blonde. So let's move on. My kids also say that. Okay. Um, here are here are a few fact points. First. If we look at the number of Israeli politicians who have started to use the R word, the regional approach, in the past two years, immediately after Protective Edge, these, this is the list, and it is uh, Yair Lapid, uh, Avigdor Lieberman, Netanyahu, even uh, Moshe Kahlon to an extent, and uh, also, of course, uh, Herzog. But what we are seeing for the first time is a new language being adopted by center and center pragmatic right leaders. That's first fact. Second, uh, in our recent polls, and also in polls conducted by the uh, Washington Institute and uh, Halil Shkaki and Tamar Herman, what we see is that the collective intelligence of the Israelis and the Palestinians begin to prefer a regional product compared to the old bilateral product. How do you see that? Kobe, that's a very good um, question. And um, this is the time of people, okay? Even if you look at the region, um, it's not about what the leaders, the leaders are doing things under the radar because they can't do them over the radar because they have to, um, they have to be, in a way, in a sense, even in the Middle East, they have to um, um, be responsible to the people. This is a different era, they all have smartphones and whatever, and they know what happened in other countries and they don't want to lose um, their, lead, their, um, their position. So it's not about leaders to leaders. They're doing whatever they can under the radar, right, Warren? Why, why isn't it open? Because they have to convince their people on both sides that it's okay. Um, and if you listen closely, even uh, again, I just saw this uh, very good interview my colleague Kubi Segal did with our prime minister, first interview a year and a half after the elections. Um, and he said, well, I'm, I'm hearing new voices on Arab media because you have to try and prepare your, your people for these negotiations. Now, um, I think what we're lacking is the same, same kind of conversation in Israel. Now, if you go and check why the Israeli politicians are talking about the regional uh, solution, is it really because they understand what it's, what's at stake and they're willing to pay the price of what it stakes, or it's a better way not to deal with the elephant in the room and that is the conflict so you know the public doesn't want to hear about the Palestinians let's talk about something which sounds um, better and I think at the end of the day it's not a zero-sum game I don't think we have to go ahead with the bilateral agreement or whatever but we have to be very honest and we have to be very candid when we talk about what the prices are for regional and is it Halabite is it the Temple Mount or is it Israel what is in our eyes uh, important and as long as people avoid asking themselves what do we want at the end do we want some kind of compromise are we willing to compromise in a way with security or we want the whole deal um, and um, you know it's 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 very interesting I think we should all ask ourselves imagine that Prime Minister Netanyahu who I think is one of the most capable politicians we've had in the region for decades he has you know he Talk to him, he's so in, he's, he's most intelligent, the most intellectual, the most experienced, the most seasoned politician in Israel and in the region. Ask yourself, if Prime Minister Netanyahu would have said tomorrow, listen, I'm looking at the region, there are these wonderful opportunities, and I've decided this would be my last term. What would happen the next day in the political system? What would happen to Israel in the next system? What would he do? What would he really do if he said, this is my last term, I'm here to make history? The problem is that we have um, a system which is there for the next elections. And that's what a politician does. He wants to be reelected. I'm not judging. I'm just saying. 
The fact that our political system is thinking about the next election, not knowing when they are, and trust me, it's so refreshing that these are not our elections, we're just enjoying every minute, you know. <laughs> this is the best show on world, the world we're having. The I, I wish I was enjoying every minute. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy ours? <laughs> Oh, you know, it's better, it's like the, the egg and the chicken, uh, the, the egg and the pig about breakfast, the chicken and the pig about breakfast being yeah, involved yeah. and committed, yeah. yeah. So it's nice just to be involved, not committed. Um, um, <laughs> so at the end of the day, I think um, the Israeli public feels very secure, and rightfully so. You know, I was talking to someone about this last wave of stabbings in the region, and, I, and you know, and, and it was a colleague of mine, and she said, what are you talking about? 30 years ago, there was the first intifada. The second intifada, there were buses blowing on the streets. Then we had rockets coming down, now we have Iron Dome, and now you're worried about some Palestinian stabbing? At, at numbers, look at the numbers. The numbers say a different story. The numbers say that we're getting, we're becoming more safe, we had no existential threat around us, Region is changing, Iran has, you know, we have at least 10 years to deal with them. So there's this sense of security that Israelis um, feel, um, which I think at the end of the day is allowing us not to really look at the tomorrow. We have to ask every politician, not what's going wrong, not who's to blame, why the Palestinians, why the Israelis. So what's next? So what if we go on like this? Where is this taking us? What is the price we're paying internally as a society. Now always ask yourself, imagine that Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and all this government and, and, and the coalition, all these politicians, the 120 politicians that we freeze, and we say there, no, that this is the last term of Netanyahu. What would he do tomorrow morning? Okay. Uh, one thing should, I think should be said, uh, and that is that uh, Bibi Netanyahu's prime minister on the issue of the Arab world uh, under his command, basically a lot has been done and it's been done under the radar screen. So he has to receive a lot of credit of seeing this strategic opportunity that we're talking about and also doing something about it, one. Two, the analysis of why so many Israeli politicians are talking about the regional issue can be also analyzed because they don't see a chance of doing anything bilaterally with the Palestinians. So it's a nice issue of saying we really gave up on the Palestinians. We are people who want to achieve something. So let's talk about the regional issue, which is an option that wasn't exhausted yet, okay? So I would put that in that category and then move to the problems again and then come with, with some positive ideas. But we have serious problems in that as someone who's personally, you know, traveled the Gulf areas and, you know, a lot of things under the radar screen, I can generalize and tell you that we gave the, uh, the, the Arab countries basically everything they want under the radar screen. Every time they had to go above the radar screen for the obvious political internal reasons, they were unable, unwilling, use another adverb that you want, uh, to go above. We have internalized, I'm not sure correctly, to understand the internal problems, the regional problems, the political constraints, in giving them a bit of a discount on maybe things that we should not give a discount. Again, theoretical, let's substantiate my statement, okay? We have peace with Egypt, 1979-1980, okay? We have lost a generation. Why did we lose a generation? We have zero territorial issues with Egypt, right? But on the public domain in Egypt, okay? School books, TV, newspaper, culture, movies, not just Israel, but Jews. I don't even, 
It's horrific, horrific. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, you know Arabic, you don't know Arabic, just for yourselves, you have to see. So the territorial issue is out. The internal explanation is clear, right? But we have a problem with the perceptions and the education. At the end of the day, it's education. Now, what does it mean in the analysis? That we have to impose things from top to bottom, right? Because it won't work. We need, you don't have the infrastructure from bottom up to the top. And how do you see that? How the problems can be seen on a daily basis when Syrians now, Shiites and Sunnites and Alawites, when they seek refuge from each other, where do they seek refuge from the Jews? The perception of Israelis and Jews asks not only if we have horns on our heads, but worse than that. They return back after they see that. Don't worry. Yeah, in the, in the hospital up, up, in, up in the north, they return back with a completely different perception. That's education, okay? Don't worry, gentlemen, ladies. They're not standing in line to donate to the JNF. <laughs> <laughs> or to join the Zionist organizations. But the perceptions of Israelis and Jews are different. I gave you the Egyptian example because there's no territorial issue. I give you also the Jordanian. Okay? It shows you how big the challenge. Now, is it worth pursuing? For my complete confidence, the answer is yes, because we don't have an alternative. So the answer is absolutely yes, but we cannot, you know, throw away the, the real problems that we have in order to achieve that. And Kobe automatically, when he put the premise in the question, he said, you know, should the United States change the paradigm and move from a, a chief negotiator, or I don't know, one, why should I change the paradigm? I'm absolutely convinced that we need the United States, the Dennis Rosses, with a hand on the steering wheel. Why? Very simple. Because the United States of America is the only one, not just vis-a-vis -vis Israel, that is able to help Israel take risks that Israel by itself will not be able to, to take and also to certain Arab countries. They need that. We need that. And without that, we won't be able to achieve comprehensive peace. So the American role is absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial. I don't see us moving anywhere without that. So from my point of view, not just American involvement, and a special envoy that works, not just uh, but also in the region. So... Uh, I think it's possible, but uh, by God, we have a long way. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, you spoke about the uh, lack of feasibility. Um, I will ask you in a moment what would be your magic step. But as a scholar, looking analytically at the Middle East. You're talking to me? No. no, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, right. 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 by the way, by the way, I'm, I'm now at the IDC. Hey, ah, you know, I okay. forgot for a second. You know, I'm the Abu Ibn Sheriff. I mean, Dennis, give me some. Yeah. No, no, no. Look, I, look, I teach at Georgetown, but I, I've already. <laughs> 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 Established that you and I are not blonde and we're not scholars. So it's okay. Go on, go on. You will give a Go ahead, Dana. Go ahead. You're very, you're very brave, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Ethan, uh, when you look at the changes of attitudes towards the Arab Peace Initiative, and when you look at potential generational change in the Arab leaders, how does this factor? And does it give you more optimistic view going forward? Less optimistic. L less optimism. Uh, it's very, uh, I appreciate the approach you presented here. Uh, but I have problems with statements made in English to an Israeli reporter versus similar statements that should have been made in Arabic to local television uh, channels. 
all these statements that you have shown us were made to an Israeli reporter. And so these people want to make uh, a, an impression. The second thing, and I go, I go to what uh, you said about, what you said, what Ron said about, about uh, prevailing attitudes in the Arab world. And th this, is, this is a huge obstacle. Because if you educate the people for so long that Israel is such a terrible entity that should not exist, we should not have relations with it, then it takes a lot of time to reverse. We do not live in the time of Sadat. Sadat was able, in one strike, to obtain sufficient support in Egypt to go to Jerusalem. But the peace, and I agree with you, the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt remained at the leadership level. It is not what we call a warm peace, like people to people peace. And as long as we don't have it, then there's a huge problem in uh, opening the collaboration to the public. The public will not accept it. And given the upheavals of the Arab Spring, leaders in those uh, potential uh, uh, collaborators, they, they don't care about the Palestinians. They don't care about, about uh, uh, any peace agreement between Israel and Palestinians, but they care about survival. And they are fearful of the Arab Spring. So this will take time to educate. Now about the US role. So first of all, even if you have a new administration that would reassess American leadership and position, the damage that occurred in the region for America, and it is, it is, a, it is a perception, the United States is still the most powerful country in the world, and will remain so for the foreseeable future. But, but we live in the worlds of images and perceptions. And the perception of the United States has been, in the last few years, as an unreliable ally. And the whole idea of a regional approach, the whole idea of a regional approach is, came as a result of this of a disappointment with American mediation. So I think that we need the United States, but again, it will take a lot of time okay. to reassert American power influence in the region. And I still think that there are certain things that Israel can do to help the regional approach. Thank you. For example, in one second, two, two, yeah. one, one sentence. I think what Israel can do, for example, on a settlement issue which is very difficult to explain, so you can freeze settlements and build only in the blocks that even the Palestinians agree. What we can we can offer again, and I think this this was a missed opportunity, uh, reconstruction in Gaza in return for this armament. Maybe Hamas will not accept it, but then you will be seen as, as a country that is interested in peace. And the last thing that you need to do is to do what we call public diplomacy campaigns, which will explain what, uh, where uh, are the Israeli positions versus the Palestinian positions and the Arab positions. We don't do it, and as a result of it, we are more interested in peace than the Palestinians, but are, be, are being described as the one that is not interested at all in resolution. Thank you. Uh, we are about to close. I will mean, say a story about when you're talking about the U.S. involvement. It's we were all thinking we're right, we're used to thinking that it would mean going ahead with a solution. And then just uh, this summer, I did a very big story with the women for the temple. There is a growing movement of women who are practicing um, the third temple. They they are they're you know they're um, having their sons uh, grow up as kohanim and they're doing this special bread and they're taking people on the Temple Mount. They really want the Temple Mount now, and this is a growing movement of women. And I went with one of them to the parliament to meet a member of Knesset from the Jewish house, and she said, you know what, I'm waiting for Trump. And she, the, the, the uh, member of parliament was surprised because it was on camera. She knows she's not supposed to, she's not to, she's supposed to interfere because, and then she said, you know why? Because I think that if Trump is elected, he will make us, built the third temple now, so she's waiting for Trump for the third right. temple. Well, um, we, need, we need to conclude. I, I'd like uh, Dennis uh, Ron, uh, just a one minute okay. response and uh, closing remarks. Okay, well, so I want to pick up on, on some of the points that Professor Gubolo made. First, I think your concluding comments, I happen to agree with, I've been saying for a long time 
Israel could seize the initiative on the peace issue by doing a number of things, not the least of which is to say, look, we believe in two states for two peoples, and our settlement policy will be consistent with that. Uh, we'll build inside the blocks, but not outside the blocks, because we're not going to build in what would be a Palestinian state, and there won't be Israeli sovereignty to the east of the barrier. So this would immediately demonstrate that the words two states for two peoples are backed by actual policy. So I agree with that. What I disagree, however, with, I think the image of the United States can be turned around fairly quickly. Reassertions of American power will begin to demonstrate that what you saw was really an aberration, not in fact the, the reality. And part of the reason for that is you have countries in the region that do look to us for as being their ultimate guarantor. So if they see that in fact the US is not going to be so hesitant, I think those perceptions can turn around more quickly. And thirdly, there actually are interesting things that are appearing in the Arabic press, not just in English. Uh, there in, within the Saudi press, for example, there have been a series of articles about making the case for why, deal, why dealing directly with Israel uh, is logical. Now, it isn't always put in the context of we should do it because we love the Israelis. That's not the way they say it. But they say, why shouldn't if we're going to pursue our interests, aren't we the best ones to be <coughs> able to say it directly rather than having it said through somebody else? This is actually something that's emerging there now in their press. And just one last comment on this. You recall when the Israelis took out that convoy uh, that had the, uh, had the Brigadier General of the Quds Forces and had Igmar Gugia's son, when that happened at the time, the Twitter sphere in Saudi Arabia lit up. Uh, and it was all applauding what the Israelis had done. Abdul Rahman al Rashid, who is a managing director of Al Arabiya, and he writes for Shak al Ausid, he wrote an article specifically about that where he said, why was that the case? And he said, look, it's, it's not, again, it's not because uh, everyone is dispensed with concerns about Israel and the Palestinians, but it, it does show, in a sense, who we're most concerned about. And again, this is only in Arabic. So that isn't to say that the point that both you and Ron made about the, the deeply embedded attitudes that have been socialized over the last generation of hostility towards Israel it doesn't disappear. It doesn't mean that this is like a light switch that you flip and it disappears. But the fact that these, there are these kinds of indicators are beginning to emerge tell you also that something is changing. Uh, and the fact that something is changing should also get us all to focus on, all right, so how can we take advantage of that? Good. I'm afraid we need to, to close, so I'm going to ask Ron just a quick comment. What would be the one thing you would recommend for us to do, and then I'll conclude and we'll close. Well, you, you know, you have to look at it like a balance sheet in a sense. What are the pros, what are the cons? Uh, by the way, the last time I asked my accountant, what's the situation in my account? He said, when I look at your left side of the balance sheet, nothing seems right. When I look at the right side, nothing is left. <laughs> I think point, that depicts the regional the point, approach as well. The point, is, the point is that with all the problems, there's an amazing opportunity. Uh, it's a window of opportunity. We cannot strategically uh, leave that without initiating. Uh, and we are doing that, but we have to move it because for my, my analysis, this is the only way for us uh, to move forward. Uh, in Thank you. Let me, let me conclude uh, in the following. I think what we've heard is A, there is an opportunity. B, it is complex. Uh, three, we need Arab involvement and we need American involvement and we need to work on the publics in the region and that is going to take time. However, this is probably the best way going forward. Let me thank my colleagues on the panel for their contributions. And uh, we will be here if you have more questions. Thank you very much.